He walked the dirty streets, famous for nothing. He said, come follow me, and they came. Face like all the rest, something was different. The Son of God would lead the way. Soon they all would say There he goes A hero A savior to the world Here he stands With scars in his hands With love he gave His life so we could be free A savior of he spoke with clarity, walked across the sea, a single word would calm the storm. His touch could heal the sick, but he was called a hypocrite. Laid behind the stone, his death was surely mourned. He left the curtain torn. There he goes, a hero, a savior to the world. Here he stands with scars. Savior of the world. He chose to take the cross, shed tears for the lost, the broken, and the needy, forgiving those who were and will be. The angel made it clear. He told them, have no fear. He's not here. He's not A hero, a savior to the world Here he stands With scars in his hands With love he gave His life so we could be free The savior of the world The savior of the world Savior of the world. Good morning, church family. And if we have any visitors today, welcome to the Southern Cross. Let's open our Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, starting with verse 12. We concluded our study last Sunday with Jesus healing the paralyzed man in Capernaum. And so we pick it up uh, this morning in uh, verse 13 with Jesus leaving the house and walking over to the Sea of Galilee. And I remind you, that's not an ocean when it says the Sea of Galilee. It's actually called Lake Tiberias at other points in the Gospels. It was, it was a lake about 13 miles long and about 8 miles wide. It's a very big lake. Probably looked like the sea, you know, when you were out there standing in front of it. So Jesus is walking over to the Sea of Galilee now. And it says in 13, He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to Him. And He was touching them, and He... And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. Now it said Levi was sitting at the tax booth. So was he paying taxes or receiving taxes? Anybody remember Levi? He was receiving taxes. That's right. He was a tax collector. 
also known as Matthew, in chapter 3, verse 18, when Mark first gives the name of the twelve disciples, he calls Levi Matthew. He's also called Matthew in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, the tax collector Levi there, he ends up writing the Gospel of Matthew, one of the four Gospels. And if you didn't know, tax collectors in uh, biblical times were despised by the Jews. Uh, so it's, it's very radical that Jesus would call him as a disciple, especially in his core group, you know, one of the twelve. Uh, Jesus started out right off the bat, you know, shaking convention up a little bit and uh, the religious traditions of that day. He calls Matthew a tax collector, which would have been unheard of for a rabbi to do at that time. Uh, they, they, in case you don't know, they extracted taxes from the Jews. So they were, Matthew was a Jew, and the Romans hired many Jews to take taxes from the Jewish population. And that's why they were so hated at that time. So after Jesus calls Matthew, he winds up having dinner with him at his house because it says in verse 15, And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Now, Levi must have had a pretty big house if you think about it because it said the dinner guests included all of the disciples plus many, it said, many tax collectors and many sinners. Now, right from the start, we see Jesus shaking things up. See, he's not only calling Matthew, now he's sitting and eating with a lot of folks that are considered sinners and, and uh, other tax collectors. No doubt a lot of them were associates of Matthew. And they were probably like, you know, this is really amazing. Who is this new teacher in Israel? 16 says, And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, was that a mic drop moment for Jesus or what? Jesus was basically saying, where else would you expect to see a doctor except working among his sick patients? I mean, it makes sense, right? It was really a dumb question they asked, but the only reason they asked it was because of their own self-righteousness. Like I said earlier, you know, it just wasn't... It wasn't done in Israel at that time. The religious folks, they kept their distance from those who were non-religious. And Jesus, he just completely broke the mold when he showed up. You go back and read history on the rabbis, they didn't do this. You know, they only called other pious Jews to follow them. And uh, they were teaching them and training them to be self-righteous hypocrites just like they were. Now that's not to say there weren't any good ones. There were some good teachers and there were some good Jews but it was, it was tradition, you know. It, it, the institutions, their religious institutions had become, for the most part, corrupt. And uh, Jesus was really making waves. I mean, they, they began to resent him right from the start. I mean, that's why he could only preach for about three and a half years before they were trying to kill him. 18 says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Now here they are, they're finding fault with Jesus again and the way he was leading his, his following. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. In other words, while Jesus, he, he was referring to himself as the bridegroom, and he was saying, while I'm with my people, there's no need for them to fast. In other words, it's more of a time of celebration. He's there. I mean, can you imagine when he comes back in his second coming? or When, when Jesus shows up, begins to set up his thousand-year reign here on earth, are we going to be fasting in that day? No, he'll be here. You know, people fast to break through this old shell called the flesh. And we try to make ourselves sensitive and humble before God so we can feel His presence. Because today, He's only here in spirit. You know, in that day, He was here in the flesh. 
And uh, so Jesus is trying to explain that to them. And of course, they didn't understand that because they didn't accept Jesus for who He said He was. And of course, you think today in 2024, He's still not here in the flesh. So you think about this very season we're in right now, the Easter season known by Catholics and Anglicans as Lent. It's actually considered a time of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. So there's a lot of people in the church world going through fasting rituals right now. You know, it's like uh, I heard this story where this, this little girl, she was scared one night, and she called for her, her mom, and her mom came in the room, and, and she told her that, she said, Mom, I'm scared, you know. And her mom said, well, just remember, Jesus is with you. And she said, yeah, I know that, but I need somebody with skin on. <laughs> so, so we, you know, Jesus was with them back then with his skin on. Today, he doesn't have his skin on. The Bible does say, however, that he walks in the midst of his churches. So if you can believe it this morning, you know, he's here. The Spirit of the Lord is here with us today. And that's why we want to, and you hear me every Sunday morning, I pray that God help us humble our hearts in the service because it's only through the spirit of humility that we become relative to the spirit of God. It's like my grandfather who was an old time holiness preacher way back in the day, you know, he's been gone for a long time now, but he used to, he used to tell us, he said, you know, the spirit of God is like this, like a dove, you know, it's real gentle. He says, you got to, you got to become relative to that before you can, you can feel his presence. You know, no strong, headstrong, kind of loud, boisterous, haughty, prideful person, we're not going to feel the Spirit of the Lord in that condition. So, we have to humble our hearts. And sometimes, you know, we go through hard things and it helps us to understand if we will stop and consider these spiritual dynamics. When we're going through something hard, whether it's physical as to sickness, disease, and these kind of things, whether it's financial, you know, financial problems can put us in straits that are so painful sometimes. Or whether it's emotional, we can go through emotional things, you know, and wind up seeking medical help and medication because we're having these emotional and psychological problems. Whatever the case is, we can find ourselves sometimes in these situations because, well, God actually loves us and He's allowing hard things to come to break us down and to humble us. You know, I went through something recently and I told my wife, you know, when it began to subside, I looked at her and I said, Kelly... It was humbling, you know. I said, what I just went through was humbling. And I was grateful. I, it was a painful experience, but it was humbling. And, and when I came out on the other side, I honest to God could feel the Lord's presence in a more powerful way. I found myself walking around with this awareness of how small I am in the eyes of God. How small I am in, in respect to the heavenly kingdom, you know, and the great power of God how I really am compared to His righteousness and His holiness. And then it makes you grateful when you realize that even though compared to Him we are so undone, yet by the grace of God and the finished work of Jesus at the cross, He has imputed His righteousness to us and He's made us holy in His eyes. Do we realize that today? It's such a deep and phenomenal thing if we can get a hold of it. Now, of course, we have to humble ourselves in repentance to access that holiness and that righteousness. We have to come to God and get out of denial. You know, when, you're, uh, when you say, when you have substance abuse problems, that's probably a good example. And I've had them, so I know this very well. And uh, I've been to classes mandated by the court. I've been to AA meetings mandated by the court. Back in the day, I was an alcoholic. And uh, I experimented with a lot of different drugs, you know, going to parties and things like that. And I wound up in all kinds of trouble before it was over. As the years went by, it began to catch up with me. And I wound up tangled up in, with the law and all kinds of things. And, you know, having issues in my mind, it was really taking a toll on me. And uh, today, I've learned from that, you know. And one of the, one of the most important principles as far as coming out of that lifestyle and finding sobriety again, is they will tell you that you must get out of denial. Anybody ever heard that before? Anybody ever been in my situation and heard that before? I mean, and it's true. And I went in there, I remember going to a class and uh, it was an AA meeting, that's what it was. And 
uh, this teacher there, instructor, was telling us all how we were alcoholics. And I was like, well, you know, wait a minute. I'm probably not like the rest of these people here. I'm not an alcoholic. And so he began to ask me, you know, well, how did you get in here? I said, well, you know, I got a DUI, and this is where they sent me. He said, mm -hmm. is that the only time you ever had trouble with alcohol? Said, no. You know, back uh, probably six months before that, I got into this little scrape of, from drinking. And w w anything else? Yeah, yeah. Got in a fight over here at this place and was thrown out. And So he, he brought it all out, you know, and come to find out, he said what I was was a binge drinker, which was still an alcoholic. Because I told him, I said, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't need to drink every day. I was, I was convinced that an alcoholic was like somebody in the gutter, you know, just always drunk. And I thought because I could go to work, stay sober, you know, for a week or two sometimes that I was all right. And he said, no, Frank. He said, there's different kinds of alcoholics. He says, you're what they call a binge drinker. You can go for extended periods of time and be sober, he says, but you always wind up circling back around, don't you, and eventually getting drunk. And I said, yeah, I do have a history of that. So I had to get out of denial is what I'm saying. They told me, they said, Frank, the first step in recovery is getting out of denial. Until a person gets out of denial, they can't even begin the process of recovery. Isn't that right? And folks, I'm telling you this morning, that principle was not invented by man. It comes from the Scriptures. See, until we get out of denial as to being in sin, living in sin, breaking the commandments of God, I'm not talking about if we've come to God and we're a Christian and we're just, we find ourselves at different points in life wrestling or struggling with something because we want to live a good and better life. But I'm talking about when we don't even serve the Lord, when we're just living a sinful life. Like it says here with Jesus, many sinners were following Him around Capernaum because He was kind and He was reaching out to them to try to help them. You know, it said they were sinners. And of course, you got liberal churches today that cite these different Scriptures and say, well, there you go. You know, we can be sinners and He still loves us and everything's okay. But we forget. Look at the very analogy Jesus used. He likened Himself unto a doctor. And he said, isn't it like the doctor to be among the sick? Where else would you find me? See, he called sinners sick people. And what do doctors do with sick people? They lead them to recovery. Isn't that right? They want to reach out and help them and pull them out of the state that they're in. It's like I've heard it said so often, God will accept us just as we are. And I know that as well as anybody. As Paul once said, I'm the chief of sinners. And He accepted me just like I was. But He loves us too much, folks, to leave us that way. See, that's the thing. He doesn't want to leave us in that condition. He will accept us as we are, but He will not leave us that way. If we walk with the Lord for 5 or 10, 20 years, whatever the case is, and nothing changes, something's wrong. We're not really walking with the Lord. So we find that we must get out of denial, that we might receive the infilling of the Spirit, we might come to a place of repentance and admit before God that we are sinners and we need His salvation, which He secured for us on the cross, became our substitutionary death right there at Calvary and gave His life for us. And so it's a wonderful thing today. Every Sunday I stand here and we go through the Bible, chapter and verse, and we won't stop until we've gone through the whole Bible. But all along the way, we find illusions to salvation. The whole Bible is about Jesus Christ coming and giving His life for sin. And so in 21, it tells us, no one, Jesus, this is Jesus' response now. He's still, he's still responding to the fact that uh, they were talking about why, you know, why don't your disciples fast? Why aren't they being real, you know, kind of beat down and going through these religious rituals of self-denial. Why aren't your disciples doing that, Jesus? Like John the Baptist's disciples and like the Pharisees. And so in 21, Jesus continues to explain. He said, No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. In 22, he says, And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wine skins. 
Now why did Jesus go from talking about not fasting to not sewing these new cloths and talking about not putting old wine into new not putting new wine into old wine skins? See, he's making the point here that his message is not supposed to be like that of the rabbis before him. Jesus is bringing a new message. He's bringing a new covenant to the people. And so he's using these examples saying, don't expect me to be like the rabbis before you. Don't expect this to be the same thing. As a matter of fact, uh, we're told in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19, it says, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? The New Living Translation Bible renders it this way. For I am about to do something new. He goes on to say, will you recognize it? So Isaiah alludes to the coming Christ and His new covenant saying, it will be something new that God does. And so Jesus is telling them, you can't put new wine in old wineskins. You know, and if you understood the way it worked back then, and some of you may, we have bottles like this one here this morning. You see, we've got wine in there. But uh, in, in that day, they used skins, animal skins, and they made these bottles out of them to put the wine in. And when you put some new wine in new wine skins, it would ferment. And as it fermented, it would stretch the skin, and it would dry it out. And so once that had happened, and you used up all the wine, you couldn't say, take that same wine skin and put new wine in it because it would ferment again and yet the skins can't stretch any further and Jesus was saying they would burst and you'd lose the wine now he used that to talk about his self bringing this new message he was saying that there's going to be these religious folks and of course these were the very people he was referring to you can't put this new message in somebody that is, is full of the old message you know I like I'll tell you, I'll bring it more home to us. Think about this. Some of you may have experienced this. I have. I come from a real old-fashioned background. Like I mentioned earlier, my grandfather was an old-time holiness preacher. And he was a great man. I mean, I saw him. I grew up around him. Saw him for many years. He had great faith. He died with calluses on his knees. I saw him with my own eyes after he died. They showed him to me before they carried him out of the house thick, round, raised skin on each knee. Our grandmother always told us that he had those. We didn't know for sure, but she said he did because he would pray all night with a regularity. She said often he prayed all night. She'd go in there to check on him in the middle of the night. She said sometimes he'd be falling asleep. You know, he'd be there knelt down by his chair and he'd just be passed out. But he'd wake up and he'd go right back to praying and he wouldn't get up until the sun come up the next morning. Whether he was snoozing or praying, he was trying and he was staying there all night long on his knees. He did that for years until there were calluses on his knees. I said all that to say he was really a phenomenal person when it come to that. So my wife got to know him before he died. We watched him pray for things, watched his, his prayers be answered in a phenomenal way. I mean, things like you hardly ever see anymore. Amazing things. There were some miracles in his ministry. And, but at the same time, he was, he was very old-fashioned. You know, talking about the new wine and the old wineskins. It was another generation. You know, and they had certain traditions that weren't necessarily supported by the Bible, but it just happened to be the time they were in. For instance, ladies had to wear dresses. They couldn't wear pants. That was y'all may have heard of that among some churches. I think uh, there's still some old-fashioned sects that practice that to this day. No, uh, they didn't really. They kind of frowned on jewelry and makeup, that kind of thing. Very old-fashioned. Well, I still know a lot of people, you know, from that ministry. My grandfather was such a larger-than-life kind of personality when it come to that. He was such a great man that uh, to this day, there's like about three at least three different churches out there that follow his ministry. and uh, But at the same time, those people, they, they, they're good at ministering to their own group, but they're not very effective at reaching this generation because people in this generation can't hardly relate to that anymore, right? And, you know, and I, it took me years to acclimate to this generation and kind of pull away from that style and that kind of old-fashioned ministry and do a more up-to-date, modern approach to the Word of God to reach a people living in the, uh, the 21st century. 
And so it reminds me of that. You know, when I read that, Jesus saying, look, you, you can't put new wine in old wineskin. See, those people from that generation, they represent those old wineskins. They had wine in them, and at the time it was new. And they worked for God, and they were great people. Some of you sitting out here today may have a grandmother, a grandfather. You may have been told stories about a great-grandfather, a great-grandmother, you know, who was a prayer warrior, who prayed and got miraculous answers to their prayers. You know, it's kind of like this. The old saying goes, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We can learn some things from those folks. And one of the things we can learn is to persist in prayer. They were very persistent in prayer. We're very flighty nowadays. We have a, such a short attention span because of computers, television, and walking around, you know, with, with the smartphone in our hands. It's acclimated our minds and made us very, very short in our attention. But it wasn't like that back then. They didn't have laptops. They didn't have smartphones. And uh, they could sit still for more than five minutes at a time and focus on something. So they were more apt to pray, spend time studying the Bible. We could learn something from the devotions of those days. You know, the Bible actually says, Seek ye the old paths and walk therein, for in them you will find rest for your souls. So what we have to do is we have to be balanced in the gospel. And in every generation, God raises up a new group of people, new ministers, a new people, to look back into the Word of God. For it is Jesus, the Bible said, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we look back into His immutable, His timeless Word, and we re-evaluate, we study it, and we present it to a new generation in a way that's relevant to them so we can reach them for God. Twenty-three says, One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, you never, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? And he and his men, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abithathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So here Jesus, and I'm going to say this as we draw to a close and start our communion service. And that's the end of uh, chapter 2, by the way. That's the end of it. Jesus was saying to them that, first of all, He's Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, being God in the flesh, He created the Sabbath. And so He knows how it ought to be used. But before He said that, He gave them a little bit of reasoning and logic. He said, look, the Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. In other words, the Sabbath was given to man as a blessing and as a gift, Jesus was saying. Isn't that right? Don't we all need a day off? We all need some time off once in a while. And uh, he was saying that the Sabbath was the day of rest. And it's a time of worship. We worship and we rest. We need to do that at least one day a week. It's healthy. Even to this very day, we should, if we're wise, uh, take our cues from these teachings and at least have a day off at some point in the week where we recuperate. They have proven that you're much more effective if you'll take at least one day a week to rest and recuperate. You try to put in seven days a week to get more done, in the end, in most cases, you don't get more done because you're operating with a mind and a body that has not had sufficient time to rest and reboot. Isn't that right? So God knew what He was doing when He gave the Sabbath, and Jesus was telling him, look, don't, you know, don't make this some kind of burden for people, the Sabbath, and create all these traditions. You know, they were pulling some grains in the field and eating them, and they had interpreted that as working on the Sabbath. Jesus could have said, look, uh, you know, we don't want the population to be hungry on the Sabbath. How restful is that? So, and of course, we, they worshiped as we do, you know, on our day off. And uh, if you think about it, there's really no other way to get restful, is there, except really to go back to God. Think about it, those of you who work feverishly and, and a lot, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say this. Those of us that put in overtime is when you finally get that day off, 
it's hard to unwind, is it not? I mean, your mind is spinning from all the work all week. you got all these things going through your head and you're sitting there in the chair thinking, okay, you know, and you'll start to get up and do something. Well, no, I need to, I need this mud day off. I'm not going to cut grass. I'm going to try to resist. Something over there needs to be rearranged. or And you'll start getting busy and it's like, oh, no, I need, I got to rest. You know, this is my only day off. And you find yourself wrestling with yourself just to relax. And you got all this stuff going through your mind from all the day's busyness. But I tell you, the best way to make that day restful is to do what they did on the Sabbath and what some of us still do, and that is start with the Lord. You know, that's why it's good to come to church Sunday morning. You come and you rest in the Lord. There's nothing better than to have the Spirit of God calm your nerves, calm your spirit, hear the Word of God and become restful. Isn't that right? And then the rest of the day, it's kind of peaceful. I always feel good when I go home after church on Sunday. It's just, a, it's a special feeling. You know, you feel like you've done what you were supposed to do. You've done something good. You know, you got the Word of God in your heart for that day. And you can kind of just rest the rest of the day. I remember my parents would come home and make us all take a nap on Sunday. <laughs> we didn't appreciate that as kids. We were wound up and wanted to play. But uh, we come home on Sunday, we had to go lay down because mom and dad wanted to nap. And I thought it was just amazing. Sunday just put everybody at ease. So, do you believe the word of the Lord this morning? Can we give Jesus a hand clap? Let's do it. Get ready. Amen. Well, let me get uh, Chris and Chandra to come up if I could and get our communion elements ready. So I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Lord on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And you're all welcome to come receive communion. sharing with you a testimony that that I had okay, and that this uh, deals with my left hand and uh, I had a good sized knot in it you know and being a guitarist and playing at the church at the time you know having a knot in your hand was not a good thing and uh, it, would, it felt like a nail would go through my hand, you know, whenever I would try to form the C chord. And I was going, oh, oh, this is not good, this is not good. Okay, and the doctor said that uh, I would probably, uh, you know, if it doesn't get any better, I would probably have to have some kind of surgery on it, you know. And then I asked him, well, you know, is that going to hurt, you know, the dexterity that I have in my hand? And he goes, oh, well, it might, it might not, but, you know, you know, but then me thinking, hey, I'm a guitarist, you know, I don't want to take a chance. So I prayed to the Lord, and when I prayed to the Lord, uh, I immediately <laughs> felt it go go down. And it even kind of surprised me. It was, oh, my Lord, it's, it's, going, it's actually going down, you know. And uh, 
probably by the next morning it was gone and I believe I had talked to other people about it you know and you know so they were surprised so you think okay that's pretty good but you know this, there's more to the story <laughs> which I wasn't sure I was gonna share but I guess I am <laughs> okay see before I had the lump I had said to the Lord hey Lord being in the worship team uh, I have found my place. I have found my place here. I'm good to go. And only you will be able to remove me from this place. And then, <laughs> which is not a good thing to say, you know. So then, in my time of prayer, I realized that. And I said, Lord, if this is from the devil. You know, my, the not. I don't really care. You know, because, you know, the devil's, he's already lost the fight. You know, and it's just a matter of just, you know, dealing with it. But if this is from you, you know, then it's, it's a different story. And that's when I put my hand, I said, Lord, if this is from you, I learned my lesson. And uh, I pray that you take it away. And that's when it started going away. Man. And uh, well, that's my testimony. You turn bones into armies, you turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the